My name is Rachel Keefe, and I am currently the pastor of Living Table United Church of Christ in South Minneapolis. I will be discussing the role of congregations in suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention, and the importance of saving lives from a theological perspective. Suicide is the last taboo of the Christian church. It is imperative that we break the silence and the stigma so that more lives can literally be saved. My interest in this subject is both personal and professional. I hope you find this informative, and thanks for watching. I'm going to begin um, with a reading from my book, which is called Negotiating the Shadows, Daily Meditations for Lent. And this meditation is based on the story of the woman who anointed Jesus. I'm not going to read that in the interest of time, but I will read the meditation, and it's called Opening Prayer. So if you would listen with the spirit of prayer. A jar cracked open. The scent of unexpected extravagance flooded the room. Judgment filled the space between perception and understanding as a woman knelt at your feet, drying her tears. She had come unbidden, unwelcome, unwanted, unclean in the house of Pharisee or leper. All who watched her found her wanting, missing how she cleansed and anointed you. But you saw more than money wasted and a life dismissed. How often do we focus on the jar, caught up in the expectations of the usual, failing to notice the human being broken open in our midst? You welcomed her, accepted her gifts, and found others wanting. Your followers today would respond just as the original 12, though you have taught us to see more clearly. Crack open these clay jars that you have paid so dearly for. Open us to the possibilities of extravagance in the unexpected encounter with Pharisees, lepers, prostitutes, all of today's unbidden, unwelcome, unwanted, unclean. And that sort of set up, sets up how the church has traditionally viewed folks who struggle with suicidality. The unwanted, unwelcome, unclean. I often talk about suicide as being the last taboo of the church. We don't know what to say, how to say it, or when to say it. And we make all kinds of mess in the process. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my story. Then I will do talk about prevention, intervention, and postvention. For those of you for whom postvention might be a new term, that is in the, what we do in the aftermath of suicide to contain contagion. Because suicide, as we know, particularly with vulnerable folks, is contagious. So I am currently the pastor of Living Table United Church of Christ which is a small church in South Minneapolis. I've been there for about two years. I have been a clinical chaplain at a state psychiatric facility. I have been a pastoral psychotherapist. So professionally, I have worked with people with all kinds of mental health challenges. And I have also had my own. In um, the spring of my, I have to figure this out, sophomore year in high school, I took a potentially lethal overdose and nearly died. And that began a very long journey toward health and wholeness. And I was very fortunate that the pastor of my home church and the church itself were very supportive. I have always said that they saved my life. If it was not for the person who was the associate pastor and that congregation, I would not have survived. They were the first to embody Christ to me. I did grow up in the church, in a sense. Um, I insisted that my mother take me to church when I was eight years old. Um, because I grew up on Cape, in, on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And the Cape was a good 20 years behind the times. There's, I don't know, something happens with the bridge over the canal. And time slows a bit. 
when I was growing up, like, we still had a girl's side and boy's side on the playground. This is in the 70s. Most places by 1975 or so, that no longer happened. But it did in the elementary school I went to. And as a result, just kind of having the, the time warp, all of my friends, my peers, went to Sunday school or catechism classes or Hebrew school or something, and I didn't. And I wanted to be like everyone else, like every good eight-year-old child. <laughs> want to minimize the ways you stand out from your peers. So I insisted my mother take me to church. She was none too happy about that. But she was raised Catholic. So there was something in her that couldn't say no, in spite of her own views about church. So um, I had become a, a participating, not quite member, because you're not a member at eight. Um, but I was welcomed into the church. I went to Sunday school and, and children's choir and then youth group and all of the other stuff. I preached my first sermon at 15 for Youth Sunday, one of those kids. Um, so I was very involved in the church. And by the time of my suicide attempt, they had no idea what I lived with at home. They had no idea how depressed I was or how much pain I lived in. So it was shocking to everyone. And we've all heard stories of people who have not had their faith community respond so well. Um, that church modeled for me church at its very best. Now as a, an adult with 25 years of ministry experience, I recognize that church had its own problems. <laughs> They were not a perfect community by any stretch of the imagination. There was all the politics, and there was all the this group fighting with that group stuff that went on. But m from my perception, they embodied Christ. They let me know that I mattered. And the associate pastor of that church showed up in the emergency room and kept coming back. No matter what I said or didn't say, he showed up consistently for a few years, and then he moved to Pennsylvania. But that's OK. I followed him. I went to college in Pennsylvania. But um, it, it all worked out. But that idea of embodying Christ in ways that save lives should be what we're about. And it's not easy to do, because we have all these preconceived notions about suicide and suicidality. So what I like to do is start off with what we think we know about suicide and people who struggle with <clears throat> suicidal thoughts and feelings. And I know that you might not be willing to just blurt them out now because we have a video here. But if you are, what it, there's no right or wrong at this point. So when you hear about suicide, what comes to mind? Surprise. Surprise. It very often is a surprise. My brother Tom. Brother, yes. Permanent solution to a temporary problem. It's a common phrase in, in the work around suicide. Giving up. Giving up. Extreme profound pain. Extreme profound pain. Very desperate. Very desperate. Guilt, guilt, sorrow, and complicated grief for the survivors. Yes, guilt, sorrow, and complicated grief for the survivors. I heard something else. Intense anger. It's also the only way to be taken seriously in the mental health community. The, the only way to be taken seriously in the mental health community. If you want to get hospitalized, need to be hospitalized, you can get in if you say you're going to, to harm yourself. Yes. How about um, things like people who talk about it don't do it? Okay. Have you heard that? Yeah. Yep. Or if I ask someone about suicide, they're going to actually go do it. You've heard that too, right? You're going to give them the idea. Well, what kind of malarkey is that? Like you could, simply by saying, do you have thoughts of killing yourself, that's really going to give a healthy person the idea of killing themselves? You can't give someone that idea. They either have it or they don't. There's a lot of stuff around suicide. And one of the things in church is, my all-time favorite, is suicide a sin? And we all fall on one side of that or the other. And that question contains what I call the ethical dilemma of suicide response. And we will get to that in a little bit. Um, 
So, do you all like statistics? No? Some yes, some no. I'm going to give you some just to, to emphasize that um, this is some real stuff. Every 13 minutes, an American dies by suicide. It is the 10th leading cause of death nationally. It is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 24. It is the fifth leading cause of death for ages 45 to 59. People, youth of color, have the twice the national average for suicide. Um, LGBTQ youth are four times more likely to engage in suicidal behavior. Um, Native Americans of all ages have twice the rate of suicide as others, as do Native Alaskans. Veterans can comprise 22% of all suicides. For every woman who dies by suicide, four men die, but women are three times more likely to engage in suicidal behavior. And the largest growing suicide rate is among what population, do you think? Yeah, it's men of retirement age, particularly white men of retirement age. And if you think about that, think of the social conditioning for men in their mid to late 60s, early 70s. In that era, if you were a man, you were defined by your work. And when you stop working, your identity becomes a question. And your value as a human being comes into question. So that that age group and that population is currently at higher risk for suicidal behavior makes sense because of social conditioning. And it was also in an era where you didn't reach out. You know, you probably have struggled with depression most of your life but have been able to keep it at bay by feeling like what you do has meaning and value. It's complex. There is no one cause of suicide. There are many contributing factors. The largest contrib contributing factor is what? Mental illness, undiagnosed depression, or untreated depression is the largest contributing factor, or the most consistent contributing factor. There are lots of others, and we can talk about those a little bit. Um, when we talk about suicide prevention, because you, you will hear people in the field of suicidology say that suicide is preventable. So, so I've even heard people say suicide is 100% preventable. Right. That is the goal. The goal is that we arrive at a day when suicide is 100% preventable. As of now, it is not. It is not preventable for all people because of stigma. We don't talk about it. Some people cannot bring themselves to acknowledge it. Some people die by suicide on impulse, particularly Young men, highly impulsive and very lethal. Women tend to engage with less potentially lethal means or less immediately lethal means. Um, so there's lots of things that go, go into the statement that suicide is preventable. I like to say that suicide could be preventable. Because I don't want to blame anybody who is a survivor of suicide loss because you all blame yourselves enough. depends on who you talk to. And my statement is that if you die by an overdose, accidental or otherwise, you're dying by suicide. Because addiction at that severe rate is suicidal behavior. You have a death wish, passive or active, if you are shooting heroin and other drugs. You know, every dose of a street drug could be your last. You never know, because you don't know how pure it is. You don't know how much it is. You don't know a lot of things about it. And all you're caring about is getting high. But do, do the, statistics the statistics that I have don't, unless it's been ruled a suicide. 
Um, so unless it's legally been determined a suicide, it's not included in the statistics. I would assume if they were to include accidental deaths by overdose or other forms of self-harm, the rate would be higher. So there's a fine line there, but the statistics are just those deaths that have been ruled suicide. Um, let's see, where were we? Right, I don't know how that plays out with the legality because whoever pronounces death usually has to list a cause of death. So I don't know, just because a family doesn't want to own it doesn't mean that legally it hasn't been named. So it gets, there's a lot of suicide that's not talked about. Whether it's reported or not depends on the laws in the state I would imagine. Um, but talked about, there's plenty of, of suicides and suicidal behavior that has not been discussed. And we try to be very careful about the language we use when we talk about suicide. Um, and it's not always easy to undo the, the previous language. Like, it is not really a good idea to say suicide attempt. Because that implies that if you don't die, you are a failure. And we don't want, I mean, that's the one thing we want people to fail at. <laughs> you know, we really want people to fail at suicidal behavior. We, we don't want people to end up dead. So we, I try to talk about suicidal behavior, suicidal activity, self-harming behavior, although self-harm in and of itself is a whole separate topic. People who engage in self-harm are not necessarily suicidal. Um, it, it's messy, but we try not to talk about success and failure or attempted or completed because it, it implies a value judgment that we don't want to be reinforcing. What words do you recommend? Um, I will say if someone has died by suicide, I will use that phrase or suicide ed, make it a verb. Um, engage in suicidal behavior is the, suicidal att the suicide attempt. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's tricky and I sometimes catch myself saying the old stuff. But it, it really is a way, when we're careful about how we talk about suicide, it's a way of containing contagion. Because people who are vulnerable, who are having thoughts of suicide and have suicidal plans, if you, say, if you talk about suicide in a casual way or in a, in a judgment kind of way, success or failure, somebody who is really at risk could put them over the edge. And whenever any of us talk about suicide, we assume someone in the room is currently having active thoughts of suicide, no matter how small a group it is. It just keeps us all mindful of what we say and how we say it. Because you, nobody wears a sign that says, I'm at risk. Right? So one of the things that help with prevention is knowing what those warning signs are. And we sometimes think we know. And there's a difference between warning signs and risk factors. Someone could have risk factors galore and never actually be suicidal. You know, risk factors are exactly what you think they are. Family history of mental illness, family history of someone who died by suicide, um, complicated, complex grief, trauma, um, PTSD, depression, mental health issues, especially those newly diagnosed or those coming out of the hospital for treatment for depression, those few days out of the hospital, someone can be very much at risk. Those are risk factors. And they can line up so that someone has a lot of risk factors. But if they also have a lot of protective factors, the risk never changes into um, warning signs. Because protective factors are what you think they are they protect somebody from being actively suicidal. And those can be support, um, social networks, church community, engagement in meaningful activities, which is why we worry when someone drops out of these things. Um, but when, when the odds are tipped between protective factors and risk factors, we might see some warning signs. And you probably know what those are. We talk about it in terms of talk. You know, someone is saying goodbye. 
You know, I've gotten the phone call. I'm just calling to say goodbye. Oh, are you now? <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. Tell me more about that. Um, calling to say goodbye, giving away prized possessions, talking about suicide, doing research online. Sometimes that is a, a definite warning sign. Unless somebody's writing a paper, there's no reason to be researching methods for suicide. Um, so the, talking about it, the language changes, people. And then um, mood. You notice a, a change in mood. They go from being engaged with their usual daily stuff to being disengaged. And it's often over time, and by the time someone outside of the immediate family notices, someone has seriously disengaged. So the risk goes higher. Um, and then there's behavior. People have engaged in highly risky behavior, put themselves in circumstances that are dangerous. One of the most common among young adults is to drive 100 miles an hour in a 20 mile an hour zone. That's risky behavior. That shows that their care for their own life is less than it ought to be. Um, increased drug and alcohol use and abuse. It's a change in behavior. Um, and there are some others. So if you really want to be involved in suicide prevention, get yourself acquainted with risk factors and warning signs and protective factors. You don't need to be a clinician to, to know these things. The bottom line, though, in prevention is if you think someone is thinking about suicide, ask them. Do you have thoughts of killing yourself? Be that blunt about it. If the person says, yes, I have thoughts, your follow-up question is, do you have plans? Do you have a plan? If the answer to that is yes, then you say, do you have access to means? Whatever their plan is, do they have access to what they need to complete that plan? If the answer to that is yes, you get them to a professional. If they are at imminent risk, then you call 911. Or you say, may I accompany you to the mental health center or the emergency room if they are at imminent risk? If, and that, that's a gut response. If your gut says this person is not going to make it through the night, you, may, you do what you can to get them assistance. Don't mess around. Unless you are a mental health professional and have a relationship in which you can contract for safety with that individual, you do what you can to get them to professional help. And your pastor's not it. <laughs> Do you know that clergy can go through three longest master's degree program in the world, by the way, seminary, three full years, and you can complete those three full years without a class on basic mental health. So clergy are not educated, on average, in mental health or in mental health crisis. And most of them have not looked at their own personal theology around suicide and say, the absolute wrong things. So unless your, your pastor has some education and knowledge, they may not be the first person you go to. Now, they could say, if you are not sure someone has just said something to you that makes you, you can call your pastor and say, you know, so-and-so just said this to me, or someone just said this to me, and I'm not sure what to do, what should I do? They should all be equipped enough to tell you what the next step might be. No guarantees, though. I have some colleagues out there who are stunningly unprepared. And I don't know how that happens, but it does. I do know that some um, seminaries are really looking to change that so that introduction to pastoral care and counseling isn't the only um, pastoral care class that is required. But it hasn't happened across the boards, and it will take a while before new clergy come in with those, that education, right? And education doesn't always meet experience well. So just be aware. Um, so prevention is not being afraid to talk about it. Really, that's your, your biggest possible step for prevention. Now, if it moves beyond prevention to intervention, that's trickier business. But you have to take all threats of suicide seriously. 
with very few exceptions, and none of you in this room are qualified for those exceptions. So you just take all threats of suicide seriously. If someone says, I am going to kill myself, you say, what supports do you have? Do you have a therapist? Can you call that therapist? If the answer is no, I'm not going to, can, will you go with me? I will go with you. I, I will go with you to the therapist. I will go with you to the ER. I will go with you to the mental health center. If the answer is no, 911 is your best option. Because my theory is I would rather have somebody alive and pissed off at me than dead. And it is not an easy call, even for mental health professionals, to determine whether somebody is talking or someone is going to do. So if someone is threatening imminently, I am going to kill myself, get them the services they need. And 911 may be your best option, which is often inadequate, but it keeps them alive long enough that maybe some other supports can be put in place. I don't know what mental health services are like here in Nebraska. In New Hampshire, things would back up for days. But if somebody is at least in observation in the ER, they're not dead. And hopefully a behavioral health bed will open up somewhere so that more supports can be put into this person's life. But we are not responsible for that. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. And for either for themselves or if they're ever with someone who is in crisis, 911 is a great, a great service as well, as is the suicide hotline, because you've got people that are trained that can help direct pretty immediately into the complicated system and network of support services. Right. Right. Suicide hotline is invaluable. I have um, a list of resources here. That includes books, what else did I put on here? Books, scripture passages that may be helpful, online resources. And um, the online resources include, obviously, the National Hotline, but also different organizations for support, um, chat, uh, live chat. Um, there's a text line. There's all kinds of things available for pretty much every population. But yes, if someone is, um, if you're able to get someone to call the suicide hotline, they will help determine what the next step is. But if somebody is calling you to say goodbye or standing in your presence threatening to harm themselves, you may not have time to do that. 911 is really the go-to. Um, but if they're open to having a conversation with someone, you know, can I sit with you while you make the call? I'll even you know, step out of the room so you have some privacy, but could you do this so that you can have some more support in getting through this crisis time? Um, that's an important thing. With intervention, it's important that we know our limits. Don't offer to do something you're not able to do. Don't do it. You know, don't try to contract with someone for safety. You know, will you promise to call me before you harm yourself if you're not willing to answer the phone at 1 AM? And chances are you're not really qualified to do that anyway. So know what your limits are. Know what you're comfortable with. The best thing you can do is know the resources available in your community. What is in your community that you could refer someone to who was suicidal, maybe not imminently suicidal, but really struggling with thoughts and feelings and you're afraid that might progress into plan and action. What's available in your community? Know those resources. Um, clergy should have a risk list of referrals. I hope everyone does. Um, if you don't, call your colleagues until you have a good referral list um, because it's invaluable. Um, it does not, just because you know what your limits are and you're not willing to be the one who stays up all night to make sure the person's safe, um, doesn't mean you can't be supportive. Doesn't mean you can't be the part of the journey from suicidality to health. Just means you're not going to be a major player. And that's okay. Interesting. Uh, 
and you're talking about clergy not being qualified. Yes. So if a clergy person thinks, well, I've been to seminary, I'm qualified, I can do this, and the person incurs damages or does take their life, my question is, does the malpractice part of their insurance policy, do you have to activate it? Because I think that might be a problem. It could be a problem. I have not heard of clergy being sued for malpractice in that situation, but it could happen. Um, again, it's, it's know, know your capacity, know your limits. And we're going to talk about the ethical dilemma, the theological issues around suicide, because this is where clergy and a lot of well-meaning um, lay people get into trouble. Because the the issue in the theology around suicide is complicated and messy. Did you know that there are seven times in scripture where suicide is mentioned? Seven. So there are seven deaths by suicide in the Bible. And the interesting thing about them is not one of them mentions God's response. Not one. It does not say the person was cast into outer darkness or damned to the fiery pits of hell for all eternity. Nothing is said about God's response. Zero. So the church has made up the theological response. And there's good news in that, and there's bad news in that. So when I worked at the state hospital, the number one question I was asked, that means the all-time most frequently asked question, was, is suicide a sin? And I very quickly learned not to answer that question. My answer became, God is not a fan. God is not a fan of suicide. Does not answer the question of sin. Just think about this. You are a person who has struggled with all kinds of challenges, and you are at the end of your rope. But you have this notion that if you die by suicide, you will go to hell. And that is your only protective factor. Now, if I, as a pastor with good intentions, says, hey, you know what? You're not going to go to hell. God loves everybody. What do you think is going to happen? That person is going to die very soon. So you don't want to rush in to remove that protective factor if that's the only thing keeping a person alive. It's not necessarily theology I agree with, but it's keeping them alive. I have no business touching that, especially if it's not the beginning of a long relationship where we can have theological discussions. I can correct theology later. Right now, I'm worried about you making it through the night. So I'm, I'm, God's not a fan. You know, absolutely not a fan of suicide. Now, on the other hand, you can have a survivor of suicide loss who also believes that their loved one is damned to hell. And so their solution is to also die by suicide so their loved one will not be alone in hell forever. I've heard this. So what do you say to them? I cannot say the same thing that I would say to the person who's considering suicide, but I still have to be honest. What I know of God is that God is merciful. Do you think there is a possibility that God's mercy will extend to your loved one? That, again, does not confirm one way or the other. Because I can't, I need to remove a theology that is, or suggest an alternative to a theology that could lead to death. The interesting thing is the official stance of most churches does not say anything about hell. More fundamentalist churches tend to say that the consequence for suicide is eternal punishment, but not even all of them, and certainly not uniformity within those denominations. More progressive churches jump right into your loved ones at peace, they're free of pain, which could cause problems. And the, the official stance of the Catholic Church in their catechism is that God's mercy may be extended to those who have died by suicide. 
because somebody was clearly not in their right mind to die by suicide. Now, they put a bunch of caveats around that. If it's this, then yes. But So the official beliefs of even the Catholic Church is the potential for mercy. Now, the reason I call this an ethical dilemma is clear, right? Somebody's life could be at risk. And most of us in progressive mainline traditions, when somebody dies by suicide, we rush in to say, it's OK. They are free from pain. They are at peace. They are with God. Now, that sounds great, right? Now, what if you are at the memorial service where I say that, and you are considering suicide? But I have just told you God will love you even if you kill yourself. What are you going to go do? This is why it is a moral and ethical dilemma for faith leaders. Because our own personal theology does not matter in the moment. It doesn't. It should not come into play at all. What needs to come into play is what will save the lives of the people in front of you. Go ahead. That's, I mean, that's, that's, if I were talking to a bunch of medical professionals, I would have a different conversation. But we are the church. We are about saving lives. Removing stigma is reminding people that suicide often stems from untreated, possibly undiagnosed mental illness, often. So there's that. That, that would probably be as far as I would go. But we're talking about church. And we don't necessarily need to know the nuances of brain disorders. We, we need to know enough so that we don't blame the person struggling. You know, it is not, the person who is feeling suicidal is not their fault. <laughs> if it's anybody's fault, it's our fault. I mean, for somebody who's struggling, because they don't feel connected in part of the community. They don't feel like their life has meaning and value and purpose. And isn't that part of the responsibility of the body of Christ? to embody Christian love, to include all human beings. So if suicide is a sin, it is a communal sin. It's not an individual sin. Because we have somehow, as a community of loving, caring people, failed to communicate the power of God's love to someone in desperate need. So is it a sin? Yes, but not the way you think. Not the way anyone should think. Because we are Christians. We are the body of Christ. If one is suicidal, the body of Christ is suicidal. Think about that. The body of Christ is suicidal. Now, the interesting part of that is the body of Christ is also the means of healing. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. There are no exceptions to that. None. Think about it. Even Judas was at the table when Jesus broke bread and said, this is for you. So that you might have life and have it abundantly. So we are both suicidal and the means of healing. This is the paradox of being the body of Christ. Because we are as weak as our weakest member, and we are as strong as our strongest member. And you remember what Paul said. What is the community supposed to do for its most vulnerable? Protect them. Just as you do with the most vulnerable parts of your body. You protect them. You, we are called to care for those who cannot care for themselves, and there is no stipulation on the cause of why they can't care for themselves. So when we, as the body of Christ, fail to embody Christ, people die. What is the position of the church on the growing number of very clear-minded elderly people who either move to a state where there's the right to die or who choose to gather up the means? so that when they're suffering, exceeds their ability to live, they can... 
right? The right to die Is issue. I don't know. I, I personally say no. Um, I will tell you that my, my mother died uh, almost two years ago, and she had um, COPD. And she was terribly afraid of what her death was going to be, because it is a death by drowning in your own bodily fluids. So she was going through, and she had a lot of anxiety. And she was talking to me, and I said, OK, Mom, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this once. So listen. You have Xanax prescribed to you. If it comes to the point where you have had enough, take it. And she, she was also on the autism spectrum. And she said, I don't know how much to take. No. I said, if you want to die, take it all. And to this day, I don't know if she did or she didn't. I know she died suddenly. I mean, she was on hospice and she was dying. But she died quite unexpectedly in the midst of the hospice. So, the, the elderly and the right to die question for somebody who is chronically, physically ill with a fatal disease or somebody who is really at the end of their life and it's just a question of weeks, months, days, um, that's a different question. And the church is likely divided on that um, because the church is divided on all issues of, divide, <laughs> of discussing Life and death, right? We're divided on abortion. Even progressive church is about divided on abortion. You know, I'm pro-life, but there's this issue of is this killing something, someone. Um, we're divided on the issues of suicide. Is it a sin? Is it not a sin? Even in progressive church, you, can, you take a poll of everyone in church in the most progressive church in the city, and you're going to have divided answers. So the division around the right to die for those who are elderly and chronically in, in um, seriously ill, it's a, it's a tricky question. Um, I told you where I stand. So <laughs> it's not a tricky question for me. If it's just a question, like for my mother, she was looking at a horrible death and one that was coming soon. If she chose to end it before it got that horrible, peace be with her. But that's a very different question than someone who is struggling with the demons of mental illness. Because there is hope for someone who has mental illness, depression, and suicidal thoughts. There isn't a lot of hope for somebody who's in the end stage of COPD or cancer or Alzheimer's or what have you. you know, we can't fix that. Um, so it's, it's a question of, of making very clear distinctions. But um, it, it's, it's not an easy question. And it has a whole different set of ethics around it. Um, but I've clearly made, <laughs> made it very clear where I stand on that. So <laughs> there you have it. Um, what about um, choosing to discontinue medical treatment? With depression, you could choose to discontinue medical treatment that can lead to right. choosing problems, to but choosing to stop dialysis because it's mm -hmm. Right. Again, it's that, that choosing to discontinue medical treatment. Where does that fall? If you have an illness that is only going to get worse, it is going to kill you sooner rather than later, I personally believe you have the right to end treatment and have the quality of life in your last days that you deserve. Not everyone is going to feel that way, and family members struggle with that all the time. But I think it's an individual conversation that we should all have with our loved ones. Those of you who have older parents, it's a conversation you should have with them. What are their wishes? If you are older and you have grown human children, <laughs> well, some of us have grown feline or canine children. So, you know, you know, have that conversation with your children. What is it that you want? Put documentation in place so that the medical profession knows what you want because they are obligated to prolong life. Absolutely obligated to prolong life. And if your decisions are clear, then your family won't be faced with, do we turn off the machines? Because you won't ever have been put on them to begin with. However, when it comes to people having engaged in suicidal behavior, DNR does not apply. Every effort will be made to restore that person to life. 
because depression is not viewed as a fatal illness and need not be properly treated for most people. There are some people who do not respond to medication and then they need all of the love and support that any community could give them and so do their families. There is a very small percentage of people with all kinds of mental illness for whom medication does not work or for whom they have an adverse reaction to medication. I am one of those people. I was um, prescribed antidepressants as an adolescent and had a pretty serious reaction. And so they gave me a different kind of antidepressant. And then I also had a reaction to that. And then 15 years later, I was prescribed yet another kind of antidepressant and had a very bad reaction to that. So there is no antidepressant for me, which is OK, but I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Now, I've been very fortunate that most of my depression was related to childhood trauma. And as I dealt with that trauma, the depression lifted. But I am still susceptible to depression when life becomes chaotic. I'm aware of that. I know what to do to take care of myself. But I don't wish the struggle for wellness without the benefit of medication on anyone. I don't care what the side effects of meds are. I would take the side effects over the constant suicidal thoughts that I've had at different periods of my life. I, I would happily trade that. Um, so it, you know, it's messy, and it's complicated. And we all get very emotional when it comes to talking about suicide. I encourage you to think through your own beliefs around suicide. Figure out a way that you can straddle that ethical dilemma so that when somebody is t asking you, Will I go to hell if I kill myself? You have an answer that does not give them permission to kill themselves. Just yesterday, somebody sent me something from Facebook in which a friend had posted, or a colleague had posted, I had this conversation about suicide with someone. And I told them that they weren't going to go to hell. And guess what happened? Person died. We don't want to be in that position. None of us do. So even if you don't agree with a person's theology, you have to come up with a way to respond that leaves room for the possibility that we do not know. We do not know, truly, how God feels about suicide, except I can say with surety God is not a fan. Think about it. God gave you this gift of life, and you want to tell God that it's not good enough. You put it that way, maybe I don't. You know, God is not a fan of suicide is the best way that I've come up with to navigate that really complex situation. And for suicide loss survivors, we want to, to really affirm that God is merciful, that there's a, a possibility, a probability, that God loves even those who have died by suicide because we know that God values all life. We can say that with certainty. We can say God is not a fan of suicide, but we can also say that God values all life, even the life of your loved one who died by suicide. So it leaves it open to the possibilities of the mystery of not knowing. And we have to do that. Because the more certain we are, the more probable it is that we will contribute to someone's death when we're talking about suicide. And I know that makes some of us uncomfortable, because that means we have to give voice to perhaps a theology that is not our own. And I will tell you, I do not care. <laughs> Deal with your discomfort. Because someone's life is more important than your discomfort. We are to be a life-saving church. That is our job. That is the sole purpose for church, to save lives. I don't care about souls. Souls are up to God. I have no power to save anybody's soul. No matter what I preach or what I say, I got no idea. But I can, for certain, contribute to the possibilities you're going to stay alive. And that you will find life and hope when you are struggling. Because I hold hope for you. We are life bearers, life givers. It's that simple and that complicated. And we have a few minutes left. So it, I will take about five minutes for questions, and then I have a closing exercise that will take about five minutes. So 
Have at it with your questions.